Oh, great. There's a couple more people just joined. So, um, probably a good time to make a start then. So, for those of you who came along last week, so remember that we got as far as beginning to talk about memory hierarchy, and uh, I got as far as showing this uh, this slide, which, uh, which which describes how, as you go down from the CPU with its registers down through the various levels of cache to main memory, the capacity increases, uh, but so does the latency. So does the time taken to to get data from from memory. So I'm going to look a bit more about how, how caches work. So they're quite complicated, so we need this quite sophisticated bookkeeping required because they have to, in, in amongst all this hierarchy, you have to keep track of where the most up-to-date copy is. And whenever we load some new data into the cache, we have to flush old data downwards in order to make space for, for new data. But all this is done automatically, and it's completely transparent to the to the processor. So programs, even at the assembly code level, still just see a simple register and memory model, and everything that's going on in the caches is is, is happening in the background, and the processor doesn't see it. Now, caches are very useful but they only help performance if the application actually reuses recently accessed, recently accessed data. And compilers can do a certain amount to your program to improve that, but for the most part, it's your responsibility as a programmer to order your computations so as to maximize the reuse. And if, you know, in a nutshell, that's the majority of what one ends up doing with uh, single node performance optimization is try and improve the reuse in caches. There's something else going on which helps, and that's called prefetching. So many, many modern memory systems also do prefetching. Now, what that is, is the hardware is, is making very simple guesses as to what data will be used next. So it uh, traces the secrets of memory accesses that your program's making and tries to have a guess of what's going to be used next and then load that data into the caches before the processor actually requests them. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So let's think a little bit more about data reuse. So Almost every program does exhibit some degree of locality. Uh, it's very rare to find a program that doesn't in some way reuse recently accessed data. But there's two types of data locality which are important. First one is temporal locality, so locality in time. So that concept is, is just that a recently accessed data item is likely to be reused again in the near future. So for example, if variable x is read now, then it's likely to be read again or maybe written soon. Second type is spatial locality. Uh, and that really think that's really about closeness in the address space. So items with nearby addresses tend to be accessed close together in time. So for example, and this is particularly true with scientific programs that work with, with arrays, then if, if yi is read now, then it's quite likely that yi plus one is going to be read sometime fairly soon. So given that, given that the programming does exhibit some locality, how, how do caches help? Well, caches hold copies of data from main memory locations, and the cache can hold recently accessed data items for fast reaccess. So fetching an item from caches is much quicker than fetching it from main memory, 
So if we're thinking about level one cache, then the latencies are of order a nanosecond instead of, say, 100 nanoseconds. But in order to keep the cache small and to make it not cost too much, it has to be much smaller than the main memory. So let's think about how caches actually work. So the main concept that we need is the concept of a cache block. So this is the unit of data which can be transferred from main memory into the cache. And it's normally a few words long. So typical block sizes might be 32, 64, 128 bytes. So they're not very big, but they're typically bigger than a single word of data, which would be four or eight bytes long. Uh, the terminology is a little bit confusing. Uh, cache blocks are also interchangeably called cache lines. So I will try to stick to talking about cache blocks, but please forgive me if I, if I mix it up once in a while. So cache lines, cache blocks are just different terms for the same thing. So when does data get cached? Well, whenever we read an item from main memory, then essentially we're always going to cache that. So there can be special circumstances when we don't, but they're pretty unusual. Uh, and it's all pretty much the rule is whenever a data item is read, then it will be stored in the caches. So if, we, if the processor reads a memory location and it isn't a copy in the cache, that, that's called a read miss. So if a read miss occurs, then we will make a copy of that data in the cache. What happens with writes depends on the write strategy for the cache, and we'll come back to that in a few slides time. The next thing we have to decide, if we're going to cache a data, some data, where does it go? So the way this works is the cache is divided up into sets. And a set is just a group of blocks. So a fairly small group. So typical sizes might be four blocks, eight blocks, 16 blocks. That's kind of that kind of size. Uh, the terminology that's used here is that if we have, say, eight blocks per set, that's called an eight-way set associative cache. So you'll see that terminology used when caches are described. So we need a method that's really quick to decide for any given piece of data which set the data is going to go into. So what we do is we essentially look at the right, the right bits out of the address. So we want to cache the contents of an address. Well, we ignore the last n bits, so the, the least significant n bits, where 2 to the n is the block size in bytes. And then we compute the set index as the remaining bits modulo the number of sets in the cache. So that's just simply taking the next m bits out of the address, where 2 to the m is the number of sets. So finding out for any given address, determining which set that data is going to go in is simply a matter of extracting a subset of bits from the address. Once we've chosen the set like that, then the data can go into any of the blocks in the set. So the next slide, try to see that as, as a diagram. So on the right-hand side here, we have uh, a diagram of the cache. Okay? So this is a 32 kilobyte cache. So each block is 32 bytes long. There are therefore 1,024 blocks in the cache. 
and I'm going to assume that there are two blocks in a set. So this is a two-way set associative cache. So I've numbered the sets down the left-hand side there. So the sets are numbered 0, 1, 2, up to 511. So there's 512 sets, each of which has two blocks. Each block contains 32 bytes of data. So on the left-hand side here, here's, a, here's an address that we want to, the process is going to load. So what we do is, well, because we've got 32 bytes in the block, okay, 32 is 2 to the 5, so we will ignore the last five bits. So the rightmost five bits are ignored. We then need to calculate the set index. So the set index is just the next nine bits. Okay. So just take those nine bits, and that gives us the set index for this particular address. So that happens to go into, into set number 412. So we're loading an address. We've chosen the set just by selecting the, the right bits out of the address. We have to choose a block in the set to store the new data. So there's two common strategies for doing this, one of which is very simply just to pick, pick one of them at random. Okay, pick, a, pick a block in the set at random, throw out the old data, and that's where we're going to store the new data. That's OK, uh, but a better strategy is to replace the block in the set which has been unused for the longest time. So what the cache is able to do, typically, is to keep track of which block in the set has been unused, so has not been accessed for the longest amount of time. And we will pick that one to throw out and use for the new data. So least recently used, or LRU, is, is better than random, but it's a bit harder to implement. And some additional sophistication is, is also possible. So there's, there's a bit more, um, there are some slightly more complicated algorithms which are in use in, in modern processors. But they are, they are basically small variations on this idea of, of least recently used. So now that we've seen how we choose where to put the data, you might think, well, how are we going to find it again? How does, how does, the, how does the cache find data that's in, that's in it? So what has to happen is whenever, this, whenever the processor loads an address, the cache has to check whether it's got the data. And if it has, it's going to return it to the processor. Otherwise, it's going to pass the request on down to the next level of cache or eventually down to memory. So again, we use this idea that we can figure out very easily for a given address, we can find the set where it might possibly be cached just by looking at that set of bits in the address. And then each block comes with an address tag. So that's just the leftmost bits. So it's the address with the, with the, block, with the set index and the block out offset all, all stripped out of it. And each block also has a valid bit. And if that bit is set, then that says that the block contains a valid address. So what the cache has to do is it has to check the tags of all the valid blocks in the set and see if they match the address that the CPU is loaded. But that's a relatively small number. Okay, so it's only the number of checks that has to, the number of comparisons that has to be done 
is just equal to the number of blocks in a set. So that's maybe eight or 16. Uh, and that can be done really fast in, in hardware. So I mentioned that we're always going to cache on reads. The question is then what happens on a write? So most programs, writes are, are less common than reads. Um, and there are two basic strategies. So these are called write through and write back. So if we use a write through strategy, then whenever we write a value, then it, it, and the data is in the cache, then we will write the data in the cache and also propagate that change through to the, to the copy in main memory as well. So if we do that, then we would normally not cache on a write miss. So if the data is not currently in the cache, the processor wants to write to it, it doesn't load it into the cache, it just propagates the write straight through to main memory. The other alternative is write back. So this time what happens is that whenever a write is made to something that is in the cache, then only the copy in the cache gets modified and main memory is not updated until that cache block is replaced by a new one. So to avoid copies, unnecessary copies of things that haven't been modified, uh, the, this write back caches also contain an extra bit. It's called the dirty clean bit. So this is used to indicate when the cache line or cache block has been modified and that when it gets ejected, when it gets replaced, then the data has to go back to main memory. And in write back caches, we normally would cache on a miss. So if the data is not in the cache, then make a copy, modify it appropriately according to the write instruction, and main memory is not updated at that point, it's only updated when that block is replaced. Okay, so what's the difference? Um, well, with write back caches, not all the writes go to memory. So that reduces the memory bandwidth requirements a little bit, but it's a bit harder to implement than write through. However, with write through, you're always guaranteed that main memory has a valid copy, uh, and that makes some other things easier. So particularly, it makes cache coherency a, a bit easier. I'll talk about cache coherency later on. With write through caches, the extra, some extra complexity comes from having to avoid the process of waiting for writes to complete. So if a write has to go all the way through to main memory, then you don't want the processor to block while that's happening. So to avoid that, uh, processors with, with write-through caches tend to have a write buffer. So this means that the processor puts the data in the write buffer and carries on executing, and then in the background, the buffer is, is, is drained into, into main memory. So what does the processor see? Well, as I, as I hinted at before, all this machinery and cache is essentially invisible to the processor. So the compiler will order assembly code and schedule it, assuming that the data is in the level one cache. So it puts, you know, puts uh, delays between instructions that, that use the same data. Uh, to, so between, a, for example, if we want to load uh, an item from, it, from, uh, from memory uh, and then do some arithmetic on it, then there will be a gap between the load and, say, the floating point add, uh, which assumes, which is long enough for the data to come from, from level one cache. However, if, it's, if, it's, if the data isn't in the level one cache, so we get a cache miss, then the processor ha will have to wait uh, 
until the data is found and loaded because the subsequent instruction that, that uses that data can't go ahead until the data has arrived. The processor can continue executing instructions, but there will be a limit on the number of outstanding memory references that are that are possible. And this this is typically fairly small. So you know, think think order order ten um, is is the right kind of number there. So you know, the processor can tolerate so many outstanding memory accesses that are cache misses. But after that, the processor will just stop and wait for the data to arrive. So eventually, if we're taking a lot of cache misses, then what will happen is uh, eventually the processor will stall and have to wait for the data to arrive from memory somewhere. So I mentioned prefetching. Uh, so one way to, to try and uh, and reduce the number of cache misses is to try and load it into the cache before the before the load instruction is actually issued. So again, the processor must be able to support multiple outstanding uh, misses, and it also needs some extra hardware to keep track of, of outstanding prefetches. Um, so the number of outstanding misses, yeah, is generally limited. So you know, order four, eight, twelve, you know, that that kind of number. So the sort of prefetching that's done by hardware is typically very simple. So essentially, it says whenever we load a block from main memory, then we're going to guess that the next block in sequence, so the next block in address space is going to be used soon. So we'll go and get that as well. Um, so you know, for instruction caches, that's very, in fact, it's very effective. Um, but who cares? We don't really care about instruction caches very much. Interested mostly in data caches. So you know, this is very determined. Whether this works or not really very depends heavily on the memory access patterns in the application code. So it's great as long as you are essentially going through memory in address order. So applications that go through long vectors or go through arrays in, in the right order um, will benefit from prefetching. But anything else typically won't. So it only works with, with very regular data access patterns. Most processors do support compiler prefetching, so they are they do have instructions which say that the processor can issue, and therefore that the compiler can put into your assembly code, which say, right now I know that this, or I think that this data is going to be loaded soon, so go and fetch it now before we need it. Um, Typically, though, this doesn't really work very well. Uh, it costs something because those extra instructions have to be issued by the processor. And the difficulty is that the compiler has to place them far enough ahead that the data has time to arrive, but not so far ahead that some other data may, 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 may get loaded in the cache and throw the thing away that you just loaded before you actually get to use it. So in practice, this is quite a tricky thing for compilers to do. And on the whole, they don't do a great job of doing it. So we've seen that in modern systems, we typically have multiple levels of cache. So it makes sense, to, for example, that the second level cache should be much larger than the first level. Otherwise, there's no real point to having the second level cache. Because if they're, if they're about the same size, then a level one miss will almost always be a level two miss as well. So, that, so it, it only really helps if the cache capacity increases as we go down the hierarchy. 
So because it's because the second level cache is bigger, that means it's also going to be slower, um, but still much faster than main memory. In many cache hierarchy systems, everything in level one, all the data that's in level one must be stored in level two as well. So everything that's in, in and that extends down the hierarchy. So every, everything in a given level of cache will also be stored, will also have copies stored in the levels below it. Um, so this makes the bookkeeping easier. You might think that wastes a bit of space. Well, it, yes, it does a bit, but it makes bookkeeping a, a, bit of, a, bit, a bit easier to do, and it also makes cache coherency easier to do. So these days, we typically have three levels of cache, uh, and all of those are, are typically on chip. OK, good. So that's caches. Hi. So Matt asks, is it, is it possible to turn off hardware prefetching? Uh, I think the answer is generally no. <laughs> um, largely because it, you know it's 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 in the hardware, so there's not much you can you, not much you can do about it. Um, it's generally speaking not particularly harmful. Um, it, the way it works is that you have to you you really have to access two. It, won't, it typically won't be triggered unless you access two consecutive blocks, in which case it will fetch the next one. So yes, it can cause some additional cache misses, um, but mostly it's not particularly harmful. OK. So. The next thing I want to talk about for a bit is, is virtual memory. So this is the, the mechanism which allows memory and disk to be, to be used as a seamless whole by applications. So it, um, it allows multiple processes to share physical memory. It also can allow a single process to use more memory than is actually physically configured. Uh, and the way this actually works is you can think of the, the application using main memory as a cache of what's on disk. So the mechanism that's used is, is essentially very similar to, to caching. Uh, the difference is that the blocks are now called pages, okay, and they're much bigger. So they're now kilobytes in size. So, you know, 4K, 16K, 64K might be sort of typical sizes for, for memory pages. And you know, instead of calling it a cache miss, if you look for something in memory and it's not there, that's now called a page fold. Okay. So terminology is a little bit confusing. Okay. So the way virtual memory works is that the processor deals in virtual addresses. So and these have to be translated to the actual physical addresses where the data is in memory. So the processor uses a virtual address space which is typically much, much bigger than the physical memory that's configured on the machine. But then there has to be this translation. So for every virtual address, then the system has to figure out, you know, is that virtual address currently stored in physical memory? And if so, where? So Pages can essentially be placed anywhere in memory. So this is like a fully associative cache. So we so uh, there isn't really the con we don't use the concepts of sets here. So pages aren't constrained to go in a in a, in a set. They they can go anywhere in memory. And 
it uses something that's, that approximates an, an LRU strategy typically. And it's also typically write back and write, not write through. So writes to memory do not propagate to disk until the page gets thrown out to make space for, for a new one. So to do this translation from virtual to physical addresses, so that translation has to be stored in a page table, which will typically live in memory. And page table lookup is relatively ex expensive uh, because it involves the operating system going to look in the page table. Uh, so yeah, page faults are expensive because they require a system call. So the page table stores the, this virtual to physical address mapping. Okay. Um, but we can't store the table in a straightforward way. We can't have a lookup. You can't just have a lookup table for every virtual page. Um, you know, if you've got a 64-bit address space, two to the 64 is a very big number, uh, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a gigantic number of. It's even, even even if you count that in pages, it's still a very big number. So we can't have a table that that uh, that has a lookup entry for every virtual page. So what we have to do is use the inverse method. So we can store the virtual address for every physical page. So then the lookup table is just the size of the number of physical pages. But then we have to do some sort of search in there. Uh, and that's typically made efficient by using some sort of hashing mechanism. And the replacement policy, yeah, it may be random or it's uh, it's or, or FIFO, so like so, so some sort of first in, first out, um, but with some preference to 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 eject um, unused or unmodified pages. Now, all this would cause a problem if every time the processor issued a load, it had to go and do this lookup figure out the translation between the virtual and physical addresses. So to get around that, the processor contains a piece of hardware called the TLB, which is um, the translation look aside buffer. So it's a rather antiquated name, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but what this thing is, is it's actually a cache of these mappings. So the processor stores a little table of these virtual address to physical address mappings for a, for a certain number of pages. So most of the time, we hope, the processor can figure out very quickly by looking at the TLB, which is on the chip, the translation between the virtual address, which the CPU issues, and the actual physical location in memory where the data has to come from. However, if the entry for a given that page isn't in the TLB, that will then be a TLB miss and will result in a lookup in the table. So, Typically, the TLB has fewer blocks than the level one cache so that it's not on the critical path. Okay. So it means that, you know, that, that looking in the TLB is quicker than looking for data in, in level one cache. So there's a limit to how big, 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 it, big it can be. However, the TLB, for the TLB to work, it still re re relies on your program exhibiting some degree of, degree of locality. So if your program does widely scattered memory accesses, so it tends to access you know, one data item on this page, then a data item on a different page, and then on another page, and then on another page, and so on, then that can, can in result in lots of TLB misses. And it's possible that in some applications that that is actually an important performance consideration. So the TLB misses can be as bad as the cache misses in, in some applications. 
One way around this is to use bigger pages. So that means that the, you know, the, the range of addresses for which the mappings can be stored gets bigger, so the chances of a miss are lower. So if we, have, if we use larger pages, then typically we will get fewer TLB misses. Um, but that's usually an option that you have to choose at runtime as to what the page size is. And on some systems, there can be some downsides of large pages as well. So you have to be a little bit careful. Okay, so the next topic I want to talk about is, is cache coherency. So uh, perhaps the, the main difficulty in building multiprocessor systems is, is solving the cache coherency problem. So, so what is this problem? Why, do, why does it happen? Well, we want to support, in a multiprocessor system, we want to support shared memory programming model. So we want to be able to have processors sharing data. The shared memory programming model assumes that a shared variable has a unique value at every, any given time. So, and if that's not true, then the model is broken and it becomes essentially uh, useless as to, to try and program it. However, if we have a, a shared memory system where we have lots of processors or lots of cores and they've each got their own caches, then that means that multiple copies of a given memory location may exist in the hardware. So for example, if two cores both read the same cache block, then that cache block will be stored in the level one caches on both those cores. Uh, and that could be a problem because we've got to make sure that the values that are stored in those copies agree with each other. So essentially what's, what's got to happen is we have to avoid the situation where two processors can cache different values for the same memory location. Uh, so this is the process which is, called, which is called keeping the caches coherent. And very simply, you know, at the very simplest level, to achieve this, what happens is that whenever a write happens to a memory location, all the other copies of that memory location have to get removed from the caches that they're in because all those other copies are now out of date. So the, the system must not use those out of date copies. So let's have a little look at how that actually works. How is this actually done? So these are this process is, is implemented using systems called coherence protocols. And in order to make these work, we need to store some information about the sharing status of cache blocks. So we need to store some information in the hardware uh, that, that tells the system things like, has this block been modified? Okay, has a write happened to this block? And are there multiple copies of it? Is this block stored in more than one cache? Uh, and there are two main types of protocol. And they differ depending on whether all memory accesses are, are visible to all, to all processes or to all caches. So the type where all it's it, you can it, the hardware assumes that all all memory accesses are, are visible to all caches are called snooping or broadcast based protocols so in that case every cached copy carries its sharing status along with it so every cache block has some extra bits associated with it which encode its sharing status uh, but that status is not stored centrally everywhere. And it relies on the property that all processors are able to see every memory request from other processors. The other option is directory-based protocol, uh, 
where the sharing status is stored centrally. So it's essentially stored in memory in what's called a directory. Um, that distinction is interesting, um, but you can't really see the difference as a programmer. Um, but the fact that this coherence protocol is there is very important if you're writing shared memory programs. So I'm basically going to talk about Snoopy protocols. Directory-based protocols happen, uh, work in a very similar way. I mean, there are some differences, um, but as from a programmer's perspective, they essentially behave the same way. So even if you're working on a system with a directory-based protocol, um, if you think of it as though it's a Snoopy one, then it doesn't really make too much difference. And, and they're rather, Snoopy ones are a bit easier to reason about. So, so I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so we've already got a valid tag on cache lines just for regular caching. So we can use that for invalidation. So what we can do is, is use, use the valid tag as a marker which says you know, we can set, set the valid tag uh, to, to zero to indicate that the Cache, the cache line is valid, or we can set it to one to show that it's been the, the cache line's been modified somewhere else, and that this copy is out of date and can't be used anymore. Okay. So we assume we're in the situation where all processors monitor all memory transactions. So what this means is that if we if a processor sees an invalidation message on the on the bus, on the interconnect, it has to check to see if it has a copy of that block, and if so, set it to be invalid. And if it sees a memory read request, it has to check to see if it's got the up-to-date copy of that, and that, that processor has to return the data rather than memory. So there's many possible different implementations of this, and they all differ in their details. But the simplest way to think about it is, and the simplest possible one that, that actually works, is, is a three-state protocol it's called, called MSI. Um, and although in reality things tend to be more complicated than MSI, it's a really use it's really useful as a programmer to have to use this as essentially the men, is your mental model of what's going on. Uh, and, and you won't go far wrong if you think about cache coherency in these terms. And the extra details are are, are relatively unimportant. So the way MSI works is that each cache block can exist in one of three states. Uh, so the three states are M, S, and I. Okay, not surprisingly. Uh, so M stands for modified. So modified means that this is the only valid copy in any cache, and also its value is different from main memory. So this is a cache block which has been written to. So S stands for shared. It says this is a valid copy, but other caches may also contain copies of this block, and its value is the same as main memory. So it hasn't been changed. And then I stands for invalid, which says this copy is out of date and can't be used anymore. So and this is probably a little bit too much detail, so I'll kind of skip over it. But the model, these models are described by state transition diagrams. And these state transitions can either be triggered by actions on the processor or actions that are happening on, on the bus, on the interconnect to memory and state transitions may also trigger actions as well. OK, so um, I won't go into too much, too much detail on that today. What I will do is walk through a little example so you can, have a, so you can get, hopefully get the idea of how this thing works. So what I'm going to do is assume that we have three processors, 
and that each of these processes is reading and writing the same value from memory. Okay, so the terminology I'm going to use is R1 means that this memory location is being read by processor 1 and for example W3 means it's being written to by processor 3. Okay. So I'm just going to walk through a very short stream of memory accesses. So what I'm going to what I'm going to walk through is R1, R2, W3, R2, W1. Okay. So that sequence of, of reads and writes. Okay. So what we've got in this diagram is our three processors at the top. And each of those, so below the processor is a cache. I'm just going to assume we've got one level of cache here. And all those caches are connected to main memory. So the first thing that happens in this sequence is R1. So that means that processor 1 wants to read the value. So we assume that it's currently not in any of the caches. So that's a cache miss. The data comes from main memory and it goes into the cache on processor 1 in shared state. So you can see there the value is marked with the S for shared. So the next thing happens, so the next action in our, in our little sequence here is R2. So that means that processor 2 is going to read the value. So its cache currently doesn't have that data. So it asks for the data on the bus. Uh, memory provides it. And it also gets stored in processor 2's cache in state S. So we've now got two copies in the system but they're in S state and they both contain the same values and they also agree with what's in memory. So now things get interesting because now processor 3 wants to write this value. So it has to get exclusive access because it wants to write it rather than read it. So the request that it puts out includes an invalidation message. So when it asks for the data from main memory, processes one and two see this and they mark their own copies as invalid. The data comes from main memory to the cache on processor three and the Processor 3 then makes the change to it. So we end up with the value being stored in the cache on processor 3 in M state. Okay, so that means it's been modified. But the other two caches, it's now in I state. So those processors can't use those old values anymore. next thing that happens is that processor 2 wants to read the data again. So now the most up-to-date copy is no longer in memory. It's in the cache on processor 3. So when that read request goes out from processor 2, the cache on processor 3 observes that and says, aha, I have the data that you want. So instead of the data coming from memory, it comes from processor 3's cache. And now we're back in the situation where we've got two copies. So both of those copies now get marked as being in shared state. So it changes from M on processor 3 to S. It changes from I on processor 2 to S. And as a byproduct of this, the copy in memory gets updated as well. So sanity is restored. We now have 
two copies in shared state which agree with what's in, in main memory. So everything's fine. And then finally, uh, you can see what's going to happen now. Processor, processor one now wants to write this. So again, it, it has to ask for it uh, and it's going to store it in M state. And the other two caches observe this request and mark their own copies as invalid. So they change to I state. So we're now back in the state where, where we have one copy in M, all the rest are in I and main memory no longer agrees. So you can see, I hope, you can get a flavor of how cache coherency works in, in multi-process or multi-core systems. Um, so uh, in practice, yes, things are a little bit more complicated. So MSI is simple, but it's a bit inefficient. It actually generates more memory traffic than is actually necessary. And it can be improved by adding other states. So have uh, an E state for exclusive. Um, so for example, this is so exclusive means that it's unmodified, but it's the only copy. Or you can have protocols which have an own state which says this copy has been modified, but there may be other copies in shared state as well. So in, in reality, protocols like MESI or MOESI are actually more commonly used than MSI. But as I, as I said, if you think about, if you, reason, if you want to reason about your program and what's going on in shared memory programs, then MSI is a, is a perfectly good mental model to have as, as, as a programmer. So this coherency protocol process throws up something nasty. Uh, and this nasty thing is called false sharing. And this happens because the units of data on which these coherency operations are being performed are actually cache blocks. Okay? So we're dealing with caches. So all this, all this happens on the level of cache blocks. And if you remember, the size of these units is usually something like 62 or 128, 64 or 128 bytes. So typically, we have multiple data words in a cache block. So this nastiness happens when, think about what happens if two processors are writing to different words that happen to be on the same cache line, so in the same cache block. So there's no logical problem here. There's no race condition. So the data, no data values are actually being shared by the processors. So it's a perfectly correct program. There's no synchronization problem. But what happens is that every write will invalidate the copy in the other processor's cache. So what happens is that you know, essentially the valid copy gets bounced back and forth between the different caches. Uh, and this causes a lot of bus traffic and memory accesses. And it happens also, it's, you know, it's not just a problem if, if, if we've got two, write, two writers here. If one processor is writing and the other is reading, then this invalidation is still going to happen and, and you'll still get a lot of, a lot of traffic. And th this can be a significant performance problem in, in threaded programs. Okay, it's not a problem if you're writing message passing programs because you're, by the very nature of message passing programs, each process has a separate address space. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty much impossible for two processes to be accessing data that's, that's, that are on, that's on the same cache block. But in threaded programs, this is a potential serious performance problem. Uh, and it's particularly nasty because it's really quite difficult to detect. Okay, you can see your threaded programming not performing very well. Um, you might be able to see that, you, that there are lots of there are there are lots of cache misses going on, uh, but it's hard to to see that it's this is that uh, that this is actually the problem that's occurring. <coughs> 
Okay. Um, kind of running out of time, but I don't have a whole lot more, so I think I'll just press on to the end. Um, so distributed shared memory. Okay, so shared memory machines using buses and single main memory don't scale to large numbers of processors uh, because the bus and the memory become a bottleneck. Um, so essentially distributed shared memory machines are designed to scale to larger numbers of processors but still retain a single address space. And in fact, these days, any modest sized multi-socket system, so anything that's connected with hypertransport or QPI, for example, uh, so anything that's bigger than one socket are in fact distributed shared memory systems. So what this looks like is, is uh, schematically something like this. So where we have nodes, so in, in this diagram, a, a node consists of a, a red piece of memory plus two blue processors. So the, the memory is actually divided up and each piece of memory is associated with some, some subset of the processors. And then those nodes are connected together via some network. So how does this work? Well, in most such systems, every memory address is allocated to some fixed location. Okay, so whenever a piece of memory is accessed, so that page will be located in one of those memories somewhere, and that and it typically will stay there. Uh, so that's what's known as a that's what's known as a, a CC NUMA. This is what's called a CC NUMA machine. Okay, you might see that term, terminology it stands for cache coherent non-uniform memory architecture. Okay, so it's cache coherent in the sense that it has caches and the caches are kept coherent. It's non-uniform in the sense that the time taken to access memory depends on the memory location. So it's quicker for a processor to access memory on its node than it is to access memory that's on a different node. Okay. Um, so then, then faced with the problem of which node to allocate memory pages on. So this is the operating system's responsibility. It has to determine that and Commonly, it does a couple of, well, there's a couple of things um, that, that are usually done. One of which is first touch. So first touch policy is to the operating system will allocate the page on the node which first accesses that page. That seems eminently sensible. Uh, however, for shared memory, for multi-threaded programs, that can actually be really bad. And it may be better to do something like round robin, which is just to allocate cyclically. So just look, just takes the pages in order as they're accessed and cyclically distributes them around, around the nodes instead. Okay, so I just wanted to finish up by describing the, the nodes on Archer just to try and put some of this stuff in context. Um, so Archer is a Create XC30 and the processors are Intel, Intel Xeon Ivy bridges. So each node has two Intel Xeon sockets and they're connected by the QPI interconnect. So each node is in fact a CC NUMA machine uh, there, and there are precisely two NUMA nodes. Okay? So each socket ha has, its, has its own memory associated with it, but every core in the node can, can access all the, all the memory in the node. Um, okay, so, so some various there are, uh, the nodes have either 64 or for the large memory nodes, 128 gigabytes of memory. Uh, and then it has the, the connection to the, to the, to the interconnect. Um, 
So the Ivy Breeds processes themselves, okay, uh, have 12 cores on them. Uh, clock rate is 2.7 gigahertz. Each core has one floating point adder, one floating point multiplier. There, there is no FMA, so there's no fused multiply add instruction on, on, on this processor. It has SIMD instructions, vector instructions, which are AVX instructions. So these are 256-bit wide instructions. So one vector instruction can encode for four double precision floating point operations. So given that we've got one adder and one multiplier and four wide SIMD, that gives us a peak of eight floating point operations per clock. So that's 21.6 gigaflops per core, or if you scale it up, that's five, 518 gigaflops per node. So each core can run either one or two hardware threads. So SMT is supported on this system. Uh, you can choose to enable it as a flag on the AP run command if you want to enable hy uh, hyperthreading. And in terms of the memory hierarchy, so every core has its own level one and level two caches. L1 is 32 kilobytes. It's eight-way set associative. And the, the lines, the blocks are, are 64 bytes. Level two is 256K, also eight-way set associative, also 64 byte lines. And then on every socket, all the 12 cores on the socket share a level three cache. So the level three cache is 30 megabytes in total. It's 16 way set associative. So there are 16 blocks, 16 lines in every set. And again, 64 byte blocks. So 32 megabytes divided by 12 cores is two and a half megabytes a core. Then Every node has 64 gigabytes of memory, except for the high memory ones, which have double. Uh, so that's split into these two, two numer regions, one, one per socket. So roughly speaking, the bandwidth, uh, the bandwidth per core is uh, from the various different levels. You get 100, 100 gigabytes a second out of L1, 40 out of L2, 20 out of L3, and about four gigabytes a second per core out of main memory. Uh, and the main memory on, on this machine is about 80 nanoseconds. So that's just, just over 200 clock cycles. OK, um, that's me at the end of my slides. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much for for listening in. Um, I'm gonna gonna sign off now. And um, thanks again.